All right, we're we're still looking at the um, the reality of knowing the truth, and we've been talking about that for the last, I think what is this our third time together? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. All right, <clears throat> and we went to several several verses, and one of the main ones that we can look at, not really look at, but just kind of refer to at this point. To go forward is uh, John chapter 1 you remember that we looked at John chapter 1 in the beginning was the word because we're looking at the truth and we read the definition of the truth and, and the definition in, in the Greek uh, word uh, aletheia is it means the basis the reality that lies as the basis of something that has appearance or something that is apparent. Um, so basically the truth is is this unseen basis for something that is seen. Now when you realize that and you look at that, you can only apply that to one thing and that's the testimony. You cannot apply that to everything your eyes lay on. The truth is not the basis of everything you see. Right. The truth is not the basis of it, you know, uh, uh, you know, all the things that we can name. Yeah. The truth is the basis of an eternal testimony given of God. So, in this Greek word, you understand that it that the truth was this eternal substructure, I guess you could say, or this undergirding power by which God did everything and said everything he did and said. Now we've already spent a couple of classes looking at that. And what was really interesting to me is when you look the word of logos, the word that is used in the Greek for word, it is actually not just a term or a phrase, it's not you know how we would de- de- define word today. When you look at the, when you look at it in the in the dictionary, this is the theological dictionary of the New Testament, and we looked at it here. It actually means the answer or the full explanation, and it actually means the reckoning of something, something being reckoned. So, in understanding that in the light of the definition of the truth. What you see is that in the beginning was the answer. In the beginning was the full explanation. In the beginning was the reckoning. God's full accounting of things, which is what reckoning is. Saying that God did not do anything that he did to get to a certain end or get to a certain point he did everything and said everything he did and said, having already the end, the point, the goal in his view. He already had the full explanation. So when we look at the word know the truth and understand when he says knowing the truth, this is what we're talking about. There is much more to it than concepts, ideologies, and theology. It's about the soul experiencing an eternal basis for everything God had ever done or said. It's uh-huh. God revealing in your soul his divine intention in its absolute fullness. That's much more than you can learn with a, with a book and a dictionary. This has to be revealed in the soul. This is a work of the spirit. Who can fulfill you know the the terms shadows and types and figures that we all throw around and use and those are appropriate words types, shadows figures that Paul uses those however when you look at a shadow there is a substance that casts that shadow on the ground there is a body that casts the shadow you cannot relate to a shadow you cannot really embrace and know a shadow only the thing that the only thing that fulfills the shadow 
a shadow that I cast, that my body cast on the, is, is actually a testimony of a substance. And the only thing that fulfills that testimony is the coming of the body that cast that shadow. That makes sense? You can't this is what Paul is talking about in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 2, he says, uh, he talks about them going to the things of the law, the externalities of the law. And he's saying these things are but shadows. But the substance, and the word there is actually the word for body, not just substance as some kind of uh, inanimate thing or, or whatever. It is a body that casts the shadow. These things are but shadows. The body is Christ himself. The body is Christ. Christ casts the shadows that we call testimony. We call the externalities that are out, like circumcision and the, the feast and the holy days that he's talking about there in Colossians 2. Those are shadows. Now, that seems weird because those were the things that could be touched, handled, uh, applied to the flesh those were visible things that could be seen and yet Paul calls them shadows this is a man that's seen a, a reality that supersedes those seen things he's seen the truth he's seen the intention that all of these things had interwoven in their testimony so when he begins to talk about the people who would who would find their righteousness in those things, he says they are intruders, intruding into the things they have seen. Now, the King James says, have not seen. In Colossians 2, the King James says they have they intrude into the things they have not seen. The, the actual Greek mean, it says they are intruding into the things they have seen. They have seen these external things of a testimony, and they are intruding into those things, trying to produce or fulfill that testimony in themselves. In other words, if the testimony of circumcision spoke of the righteousness of God and its circumcision of the flesh, instead of coming to the substance that Christ is of those things, they're trying to step into those visible things and become the the fulfillment of that testimony and say it like this they're trying to fill up a shadow that their body did not cast and every time we uh, attempt to be holy be righteous be all of the things that you know religion would have you attempt to be we are attempting to fill up a shadow because words are terms, words are shadows too. There's only one substance to these words, righteousness, holiness. The only reason there was a right ever written in the scripture was because the truth was the basis of it being written. Yet we read that word and we think it applies to us or we think we can become that. Just like the shadow. When that shadow's cast, there's only one object that, shat, that, that casts it, and there's only one object that can fulfill its testimony. He's the same way. And every time we try to be or try to do or try to become, we are in, uh, we are attempting to step into a shadow that we did not cast. Okay? Now, having said that, We'll get back into the list. <laughs> We've been talking about Jesus saying, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And we've been looking at basically in, in, at the beginning of these lessons the, not, the nature of the truth. Now, as we go on in these lessons, we're going to deal with the nature of the truth, we're going to deal with the need and the means of knowing the truth, and we'll touch on that tonight, I think, hopefully. And we're going to also look at the, the inward ramifications, the judgment of knowing the truth. 
And in that, we'll learn what Jesus means by sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is true. And I'm telling you, the word he's talking about there is not the Bible. The word he's talking about there is himself. That word we just referenced in the first chapter of John. It's the same word. Thy word is true. You are sanctified in the word, in the truth. Now we'll talk about that as we go. But, so we've been looking at those those verses and we've, we've coupled that to where Jesus also says to them in John chapter 5, the first one is in John chapter 8 where he says you shall know the truth. That's John 8, uh, I think verse 33. The other is John chapter 5 verse 39 where he is confronting the Jews again. Now the first are Jews that believed on him in chapter 8. These are Jews that haven't believed on him. But you'll notice they're in the same situation. They're in the same condition. Believing on him didn't change these people's condition as far as their understanding. There is a knowing of the truth that has to take place for that. Now he's going to the Jew in John chapter 5 and he says to them, you do search the scripture." It's in the, in the uh, indicative mode. It's indicative of a manner of life for the Jew. They are scripture searchers. They, they memorize the scripture. They, they wrote it, and then they would write it again. I mean, you know, they would write the whole five books of Moses out longhand, and then they'd start over. So he says to them, I know you search the scripture. In them you think or assume that you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me bringing the whole uh, multiplicity of the testimony of the scripture into the, into himself and saying it's all about me. I've been, I'm the object of the testimony. It has no other object, no other theme, no other meaning. There's no other amen, and that's going to be important as we go tonight. There's no other amen to these, these words that you're reading but to me. I'm their conclusion. Amen. Now, most Christians don't even believe that, let alone the Jews of his day. I'm the conclusion of the writings. I mean, we read scriptures, uh, you know, in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Why? Because he was the will of God done. It wasn't just something he had to come and do. It was who he was. He was, his coming was the doing of the will of God. Because he came as the intention of God in its fullness. Now that's repeated in Hebrews, but you have to see that in Hebrews 10 where he quotes that psalm. And you have to go back to Hebrews chapter 1 and understand the premise of that. God has spoken in Son. Now we all, I'm, Jim teaches these scriptures and Brother Monk and all, you guys know these scriptures, so we're just touching on them to get to the point. But one thing, and, and I had it here to look at, one thing that always intrigued me about Hebrews, and this is in, in a line of what we're talking about, is how he begins the letter. You know, all of the others, and there's a great debate on who wrote Hebrews, and I, I don't enter into that debate. I have my, you know, ideas, but it really doesn't matter. Because apparently it didn't matter to the writer that you know who wrote it. And that's what always intrigued me, was that he didn't start it as Paul, an apostle, or Barnabas, an apostle, or, you know, because there's, there's that question of who did it. He started it off the only way he truly could and stay true to the whole intent of that letter. Yeah, God. God. Amen. He started it with the word God. Why did he do that? There's a real reason he did it. He didn't just do it for literary impact or any of that. He did it for a very specific reason. And you have to understand it in the light. This, what he says here. You have to understand, he starts it off with that word, God, and it governs the whole entire letter. Because what he's about to do, 
is present to them the superseding reality of an entire age of testimony. He's about to present to them the object of their conclusion, the spiritual meaning behind them all, and that's why the word better is used so many times in Hebrews. It's not because it's better, you know, how we say this, this shoe is better than this shoe. No, it's better because in the coming of the new, in the coming of the second, in the coming of the spiritual, he, in, in that presence, he brings with him the, the fullness and the conclusion of everything the first pointed to and stood for. That's why it's better. The better promises that we now have as those in the new covenant is not because our promises are better than the Jews. It's because the better promises is what we have now is the fulfillment of the promises given to the Jews. You understand? That's why, you know, Peter and Paul in the Acts says he hath fulfilled these things unto them, the fathers, and unto us, their children, in how? Raised in Christ from the dead. That's the fulfillment of everything God ever said to the fathers. That's why I can say God has spoken fully, finally, in the most conclusive manner, in Son. That's why, that's why that's the next phrase is after God at the beginning of Hebrews. But he's wanting them to understand. He is not saying that the scriptures are invalid, that the testimony, what they knew to be as the scripture, what was the scripture, he's not saying these things are invalid. That's not what he's saying. There are people today that believe that's true. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying they're invalid, that they mean nothing, they're meaningless. That's not his point at all. I wrote here, and again, we have to keep in mind that the understand or the definition we just read about the truth. He's going to describe in great detail how God in his son brought the substance of every element of that external, visibly apparent system. The area making these things and the practice of them not only insufficient as the spiritual life but now in absolute contradiction to the intention of God himself. To hold on to the external things was now an absolute contradiction to the intention that those external things had given of God when they were given of God. They were never the end. They were always pointing to an end that was coming. Circumcision was never the end. It was always about some reality, an inward reality that was coming. Paul refers to it as the circumcision of the heart. Where there is true sanctification and truth. That's what the circumcision of the heart's all about, and we'll talk about that later. But so he's gonna he's gonna say he is not nullifying the scripture. He's showing the scripture in their absolute uh, conclusion in their absolute amen. He is declaring the Son himself as the so be it of God with reference to everything God had ever said or did. Amen. See, that's the, that's the important thing to understand. And that's the Son who lives in you. God has spoken, summed up everything of his of every means and method by which he's spoken to the fathers, he has summed it up fully and completely in his son. Not just send his son to say it or to do it, but to in his son, have in his son, as his son, the conclusion, the conclusive amen of it all. Does that make sense? Okay. So, there's another, there's another verse here, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, that, that talks about the nature of this and the distinction between the two, the, the, the new 
the, the old and the new as it is referred to. The external and the internal, uh, eternal reality. And one is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. And it's it says this, For ye are not come unto a mount that may be touched, and burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Understand, this is what he's saying. You haven't come to that. To something that can be touched. Something of material construction. Something that's evidenced in the natural. That's not what you've come to. The thing is, they were all going back to something because they had no understanding of the superseding nature of the internal and eternal. They were still stuck on the validity of the external. They were not knowing the truth. They were knowing and trying to find reality in that which merely pointed to truth. Now, you can, you can make great parallels in, you know, today of how Christians are and how we have kind of created our own testimony, our own types and shadows. But we call it real. You, know, you can go to the extremities of not cutting your hair, not wearing makeup. Or, you know, for, for women, of course, it was always pointed toward women, apparently. Okay. But it was always, you know, don't do this, don't do that. That was the type of what they conceived to be righteousness. But it's external. I remember we were in Mexico one year and there was this guy that was speaking. And one of the things he said was that we were, the intention of us, the whole intention of the believer is to give visibility to the invisible God. To give visibility to the invisible God. And I thought, okay. So I asked him, I said, so what happens when my body is in the ground? And I can no longer give visibility to an invisible God. Does my purpose for existing end? You see, the absurdity of those statements, we have to understand the thing that, the reality that we have come to is not visible. It's not material. No. It can't die. No. It can't even get sick. I'm talking to TV if you like. It doesn't go down, it doesn't go up. There's no roller coaster ride in this. Amen. It is an eternal, fixed reality. It's the basis that every, everything God has ever done stands upon. It's the solid foundation that's sure and tried, known as the truth. That's what we stand on. That's who is in us. The whole point is not the truth being there. The whole point of even Jesus was knowing the truth that is. Knowing the truth. Because if we are not knowing this eternal reality, we're going to seek for something we can see, taste, touch. And that's, and you go to Colossians chapter 2, that's the very thing he says. That they're finding themselves in these things. Touch not. Taste not. Handle not. Right? right? Why? Because they are still stuck on the shadows because to them, those shadows are real. Mm -hmm. Because those shadows, see, it seems twisted to us. The shadows, the things that aren't real, are the things that they could see. The things that Paul understood to be real and superseding in glory was that that could not be seen with a natural eye but had to be revealed in his soul and, and, and comes the, the knowledge of which comes when the eyes of your soul are flooded with light. And this is what it means to know the truth. That's something of the nature of the truth. It's eternal. And it's not caught up in your cerebral, understand, cerebral understanding of scripture or teachings, ideas, theologies. None of it. The biggest lies on the planet are disguised by doctrines and theologies. The truth has no reference to any of that. You can read your Bible all day and still the lie governs your heart. 
the truth and the truth only is the thing that the Spirit of God makes known. <clears throat> I'm telling you this. I want you to just under, just at least listen to the words and ponder it, and you can you can ask me or or just walk out, whatever. <laughs> but listen, the truth has no reference point to you or to me. We are not the reference point to anything that can be called the truth. Only one is, and it's the truth himself. And I've said, the truth doesn't need your application to give it substance. The truth is his own substance. Right. Amen. So the knowing of the truth is not you knowing a theology and applying it to your life. The truth is a life given of God to you. It's, 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 it's. All right, so... You're not, you're not come to what can be handled, touch, something of materiality. This is what is meant at the beginning of Hebrews uh, 12, too. When the writer calls Jesus the author and finisher of faith. Remember those verses. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Right? Right. Now notice what it doesn't say, and when most people, um, when most people quote these, even read them or quote them, they'll use this phrase. They'll say it like this: "He is the author and finisher of our faith." That is not what it says. That is not what it says. It does not say he's the author and finisher of our faith. Now we want to make it that way because we want to make us ourselves part of the picture. Because we want to bring it into right now. What I want you to understand is he's the author and the finisher of faith. Period. Now, if you look at what he says in Hebrews 11, he's summing the whole thing up here in this statement. It's a faith that looked for him, waited on his coming, waited on all, all of the things they looked for in Hebrews 11. And they saw it afar off as something they could not yet partake of and handle and uh, 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 possess inward. Those, all of those things were faith. That's the faith. It saw it afar off, saw it was coming. There was an expectation bound up with that faith. But he is not only the author, and the word author there means that he was the origin of that faith of that expectation. He was the origin of it. But he's also the conclusive object of it. Finisher. The end of it. The amen of it. That it cannot go beyond him. If you look at beginning and end, you can't look at it linearly. You can't say he was the beginning here, he's the end here. No, it's like this. He's the beginning and the end. Eternally, that's who he is. And when you read that phrase, beginning and the end, it's the same thing as reading the truth. It's the same thing. He is the truth. When you read author and finisher, same thing, the truth. Looking unto Jesus, the truth that they were looking for. The substance, the underlying, undergirding substructure, power that was the basis of everything Abraham looked for, everything all of those types of shadows stood for, they were waiting on his coming. They were waiting on him. So now he speaks to those who have come to him, who have him living in them, and he says, now, the occupation of your heart now is looking unto him. Not waiting for him to come, but looking, beholding him who has come. Knowing the truth is that. It's not about you learning a new thought or getting some you know, greater grasp on a, on a theology or a verse. It's about him becoming the gaze of your soul and the object that governs your heart. 
and you know him as the amen of God's eternal intention and you never look for anything else as that you are seeing him as the amen uh, we're going to look at this um, so the writer is taking the entire history of these people Israel, the Jew to whom God had given a sure expectation and he's saying that Jesus Christ is the basis and the object of everything they waited on, showing that the object and substance of the faith of them in Hebrews was spiritual in its nature. It wasn't some other external thing that was to come. It was a spiritual embodiment of those things, the spiritual meaning of those things. And that's what's, that's your salvation. That's who lives in you. So that brings me back to the beginning here. God. Every prophetic utterance of God, every way and means he spoke to the Father, every miraculous event, all of it is now culminated in one Son. Or in the person of the truth. You could say it that way. So, that is why the audience he's speaking to is very important here. Now, I think we, we touched on in Luke 19 where he talks to them. It says verse 42 through 44, and he says, If you had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, you, did we realize that? Did we talk yeah. about that, the day yeah. of the visitation? Yeah. Yeah. They had missed the day of their visitation. And what that's talking about is him not visiting them, leaving, visiting, leaving. It's about him coming as everything that their hope was based on. Him coming as the end of their hope, the end of their expectation. This was the visitation. But they held to the external. And he said, because you did this, they will come and they will destroy this external. There won't be one stone left upon another. Basically, everything's going to be in ruins and you're going to lose everything. And I'm telling you, this is why there's warnings in Hebrews of not neglecting your great salvation. Of not refusing him who's speaking from heaven. Because their refusal to make that inward transition from the seen things to the unseen. From the seen things to the spiritual substance. And their refusal of him as that spiritual reality, they lost everything. And what I'm saying to us today is that we, if we refuse this reality that is your unseen, perfect salvation that he is, so that we can go about and try to establish one of our own, we've missed it. Because he doesn't have a third option for us. Amen. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say. Listen, if you miss this, you've missed it. And that's not a condemning thing. That's a warning in truth. If your heart's not pursuing spiritual reality, your heart will be bound to an external life. And I don't care what that external life is. It's all alive. It's not the spirit of the truth revealing the Son. And I'm talking about in every sense. I use the word righteousness or holiness. If you're trying to find that in yourself and you're trying to be the evidence of that word, it's a lie. There's only one evidence of that word because there was only one basis for that word ever existing. So, when we stopped in the last class, these all these, this, this all goes together. When we stopped in the last class, when we were talking about the knowing of the truth, it was in Proverbs 22, where he says, this is Proverbs 22, 20, and 21. 
Have I not written unto the excellent things of counsels and knowledge to make thee to know the certainty of the words of truth? That thou mayest carry back the words of truth to them that sin for thee. Now to me, this is Paul saying, God revealed his son in me that I might preach him to the Gentiles. Those who God sends him to, except they be sent, how can they preach except they be sent? There's only one way that God truly sends any of us, and that's in the seeing of his son. You're not sent just because you have a dictionary, a vine's concordance, or, 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 or strong concordance, and a Bible. The sending in every single place in the scripture where he says, send me, or I shall send you, it was always coupled with what? An encounter with Christ. A seeing of the Lord. That's with Moses at the burning bush. That's in Isaiah 6. That's in Ezekiel where he sees the one man in glory and he is sent to the house of Israel to show the house to the house. It's all the same. That's what Paul means every time he uses the word apostle. It's not some kind of exalted title for man. It's one who's been sent. How is he sent? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? That's what it's about. So, what does it mean? He's written to us wonderful things of his counsel and his knowledge so that the writings was not the end of it. There was a so that or an intention in the writings, right? right. It was so that those words of truth could come to the truth. Or that, let's say it this way, how it's said. We could know the certainty, the sureness, firmness, and truth of the words of truth. You see, when you read these words, if you are still the object in view, there's no certainty to these words. There's still questions, concerns. It's just like when the, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. He was in the Holy of Holies and God beheld him and was satisfied right there. Is that true? Yes. But what was the condition of those outside waiting? Mm -hmm. They had no clue. They knew nothing. There was uncertainty. They were praying, hoping, waiting, and expectation for the appearing of the one whom they could not yet see because they knew in the seeing of that one, the certainty of their salvation would be known. And could not be known in any other way. They couldn't send a messenger into the Holy of Holies just to check and see what was going on. And I'm telling you, most preachers try to try play that role. Most Bible teachers try to play that role. I'm going to sneak in, and then I'm going to tell you how it is. No, I'm telling you, I can't tell you how it truly is. I can't tell you the truth. All I can declare to you is the reality that is being revealed in my heart and say, come and see a man. Because your soul will not know the truth by hearing my words concerning the truth. Now, my words may be, may be truthful in that I am seeing him who is the truth and speaking out from that. But you will not know the truth until you see the one of whom I'm speaking. Just like the Bible. You won't know the truth just reading the words in it. You know the truth when you see the amen that was behind every word written. And that's revealed in your soul. Not, not, not uh, accepted in your brain. You know, it's like, uh, well, we won't go there. But I did, he, he was talking about the example I used in the last class. The last class I used an example of kind of in modern times we send texts to one another. You know, we're always texting on the on the telephone. And um, I said, let's say I send you a text, and I say I'm going to meet you at a certain place at a certain time, and I mean every word of it. I have intention 
to be there. I'm going to meet you. They're true words. There's no doubt in my mind about it. There may be in yours, but there's not in mine because I wrote the words to you. So I know my intention. So what do you need now? Do you need to read those words and believe them really, really hard? And then that satisfies the intention of my words. Then you know the certainty of my true words. No, that's not what you need. What do you need? What will bring the certainty of those true words into reality and into realization? Me. My presence. My presence will bring truth or sureness to those true words I sent you. And you don't need anything else. You could believe those words and never meet me, and those words are still not confirmed, even though they're true. And if you met, if you went to a place other than the one I said I'll meet you, and you didn't meet me or know my presence, those words were not certified in you, but they were true because I was going to meet you there and was there to meet you. You see that? The whole thing. What brings the truth of the words is the presence of the person. And it's the same way with the scripture. It's the same way when you're reading the scripture. It's the same way when you're hearing someone speak. The certainty of the words doesn't come because you accept the words as true, but believe them to be true, study the words, know the definition of the words. No, the presence of the person who was the end goal of those words is what confirms them in your heart. And as long as you are the confirming word, the confirming object of those words, there is absolutely no certainty. I used to read righteousness and I did everything that I was told to try to bring certainty to that word in my heart and guess what? It brought nothing but condemnation. You know, Paul was a man who knew the certainty of the words probably better than anyone. Or he knew the words of certainty. He knew the words of truth better than anyone. And he tried his best. Read Romans 7. Tried his best under that law to do it, to be it. And he said, every time I try to do the good the law describes, present is always, our evil is always present. Because it's me trying to fill a shadow that my body didn't cast. How did he come to the end of that frustration? It wasn't crying out, wretched man that I am. That's not what brought him to the end. I mean, that was a probably an everyday occurrence. And I mean, it wasn't me. And I hear people today just lauding the fact that they can just say, oh, I'm a wretched man. I'm a piece of garbage. Oh, Adam, is he stinks, you know. Of course he does. But where's Christ in that? The answer is not found in how sorry you are. The answer is found in Christ. The, the knowing of the truth is not knowing how sorry Adam is. Knowing the truth is knowing him who supersedes everything Adam's not. Who is everything Adam is not. And in the appearing of that man, he sees a righteousness that's already fulfilled in him. That's Romans 8. He sees a life that the law can never condemn because that life was the meaning of the law. That was the point of the law. It was that life, not mine better, but that life. Not mine measuring up or lining up. It was that life living in me. That was the fulfillment that it was all about and I tried to fill a shadow that I didn't catch. And there's nothing but frustration there. The certainty of those words, the certainty of the testimony, the certainty of any phrase, anything, any, any event, any of the certainty of it comes in the appearing of the person, the presence of the man. And of course, we understand that Peter says this, and, and you know, the certainty of the words of truth, and he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Or we have the prophet's word in their sureness or in their certainty. Go back to Hebrews 1. 
That's Hebrews 1, right? <coughs> every, every way and means and method God spoke to the fathers by the prophet hath now, at the end of those days, spoken in his son. That is, we have a more sure word of prophecy. That's not we have the prophecies, you know, more certain to be fulfilled one day. That's we have every word of the prophets in their absolute certainty. And amen. Now, and he says, because of that, we do well giving heed as to a light shining in a dark place till the day may dawn and the morning star may arise in our hearts. That's where it has to take place. That's where the truth is known. Not in your brain, in your heart. That's where the dawning of the newness of reality comes in your heart. You don't just believe it. You experience the person of it. Believing it will get you nowhere. <laughs> Knowing him is the answer. Paul believed the scripture, but he didn't even know the meaning of the scripture until he saw Christ. Because your believing of something still leaves you having to apply it. But you seeing the truth, the application's already made. And perfection is already in view. So he said, we have this prophetic word in its absolute certainty. And then he goes on, the first, knowing no prophecy of the writings comes a private exposition. I'm reading this from the Young's literal translation. No writing, none of the scripture, none of what they said, the prophets, came with private exposition. The King James says private interpretation. For not by the will of man did every prophet come, but by the Holy Spirit, born on holy men of God. Now, what is the basis of him saying that? What he's saying there is that they didn't get to pick out what they were going to say. Or they didn't say, okay, God, I hear you. Now I'm going to interpret what you said. He's talking about a true and perfect basis for every word they said. What was it? The truth. They spoke with one basis, and that is the truth being revealed to them. The spirit of truth moving on them. So what was the basis of this? It's just like um, the basis of it was this. This is this is uh, the same thing as uh, um, remember. We, I think we read it. The basis of Peter's statement here was on the Mount of what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, and God saying, "This is my beloved Son." in whom I am well pleased. That was the basis of him saying, we have the more sure word of prophecy. Why? Because on that mount they saw, now they saw it in the testimony, but they saw what would take place in the resurrection. That's why he says when he comes down the mountain with them, tell no man these things until after the resurrection. He's seeing what takes place in the resurrection where there is the transition from the first to the second, from the natural to the spiritual. And, and, and what he's seeing is that all of the law and the prophets, that's Elijah and Moses, that you see meeting with Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration, you see them summed up, fulfilled, and superseded in his Son. This is my beloved Son. In that, and upon the authority of that, he says, we have the sureness of the prophetic words in a person in this son. Now that's the same thing that Paul would say when he tells, you remember, uh, he's speaking of the resurrection. This is in Acts 26 when he's before Agrippa. And he's on trial now. And he tells them all of the things about the resurrection and, and he tells them his account of meeting Jesus, basically. And he says to them, um, uh, let's see. 
Yeah, Festus, Festus says to him, you've lost your mind, Paul. And all of the things he says, you are, you speak as a madman. You're a crazy man. And Paul says, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak forth the words of truth. Now remember what we read in Proverbs 22, the certainty of the words of truth. He says, I preach the words of truth and soberness. Now, he is declaring true words, the true words, because he knows he cannot declare the truth. Only God can reveal the truth. He can speak words of truth, but he cannot reveal the truth. Only the Spirit can do that. But the word soberness caught my attention. And this is, this is something that we have to look at for a second because we're going to see the basis of this. In the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the word soberness is defined as this. Without illusions. Without illusion or a false perception. Calling something real that's not real. He's saying, I'm speaking to you as a man who's no longer bound to the illusion." That's what he's basically calling his whole time under the law. It's the same thing as saying shadows, is it not? I was bound by an illusion. I speak now the words of truth without illusion. Now I'm seeing the words of truth in clarity because I'm seeing him who defines every word that is true. No illusion. No imaginations, no images that I festered up because of something I read, so I believe it means this. No, just as the prophets could not interpret these things, when you read the scripture, you can't interpret these things either. It's not left for your interpretation. That's why the truth revealed brings his own substance and becomes the interpretation and the evidence of these things. It doesn't leave it up to you. Teaching, preaching, leaves it up to you. I don't care how well it's explained. Let me tell you, I don't care how well it's explained. People will hear it and make it mean whatever they heard. That's right. But the truth doesn't permit it. The truth revealed doesn't permit that. So what's the authority of Paul saying that I speak the words of truth in soberness. The, the authority of that is, is his encounter with the Lord. He saw the Lord. He saw Christ. And that's the only authority of these things. That's why this man in the same chapter, 26, before King Agrippa can say, I am speaking, uh, yeah, I've got it written here. For this reason, on the same basis and in the same uh, context. For this reason, the Jews have seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand this day testifying to small and great. Listen to these words. Stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. That Christ was to suffer, and by reason of the resurrection from the dead, he'd be the first to proclaim light to the Jews and the Gentiles. You see what he's saying? This is a man who's now beheld the, the entire basis of everything the prophets said and Moses said. And he's saying, I'm declaring and speaking to you of this risen Christ, I'm declaring to you nothing but what they declared would come. What is that? I am declaring the truth to you. I'm telling you the truth. I've seen the one of whom they spoke. I've seen him. Now, we're going to see that's I don't know where to go here or not, but that is basically 
the whole basis of the judgments that Jesus pronounces on the Jews. Uh, we read it in John chapter 5 when he's referring to Moses. And he says to them, Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, and it is Moses whom you trust. Because you will not believe me. You have not believed Moses. He wrote of me. Now to a Jew that would be the greatest of offenses. Because they held Moses to a great esteem, right? So that would be a tremendous offense to these people. But what he's doing to them is saying he's the one that's judging you because you are rejecting the whole basis of his writing. You're rejecting the point of everything you wrote. I'm the point of it all. Not you, not your righteousness, not you adhering to a law, not you being obedient. It's about me. It's who I am. It's the life that you're rejecting. He's talking about a life, and that life is me. So in the rejecting of the point of his writings, the reason he wrote, the object of his writings, he is now accusing you and condemning you and judging you. Now, he does this also, and this is going to be kind of the basis of where we go. He does this also in Matthew chapter 12. I think he does it a couple of times there. And one of the places he says that the people of Nineveh will stand up and judge this these people because of the, you know, the, the great thing that happened in Nineveh when uh, Jonah went there and declared the gospel to them, as it were. And also, he speaks of a woman, the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south, and says, she shall rise up in the judgment against this generation. Now, this is this is beautiful. I, I wrote that here because this is important to understand why he does this. Now, I'm going to turn to a couple of places here and I'm going to read a couple things that I wrote in these notes he pronounces these judgments in chapter 13 of Matthew he says this blessed are your eyes this is 13 verses 16 and 17 of Matthew blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear the things which you are now seeing, and are hearing, and now have and have not heard them. What were they seeing? What were they hearing? Him. That's why he's saying. You're seeing everything they wanted to see. See, that seems anticlimactic to the believers of today. You know, everything they wanted to see, everything they desired to hear, you're hearing it. I'm him. And like most Christians, when you teach that or you say that to them, they're like, that's it? Because they want this big light show or laser light show, you know. They want some big boom to climb it. If you knew the gift of God who was in your midst, you would understand there was no greater conclusion to these things. You wouldn't need anything else. You would know the amen was the end of the thing and the amen was sufficient. And we're going to see this word amen come to a, in, in, a, in a story, but it's on the heels of this, and we've gone over our time, so I'm, I'm not going to get to the story, but uh, I just kind of, I guess, mumbled a lot tonight. But uh, I'm trying to at least get us to a point where we can go on in this. And, and you know, for the, for the uh, welfare of those who haven't been with us to bring some things together. Um. This is what he said. And the reason he does this, when he talks about the judgments, look at this. Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. 
Now, again, they had the one with the people of Nineveh. And I would I would say you go there in Matthew 12 and read all of it. Um, but he says this, A queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and lo, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, see, to, to, to just regular Christians, to Gentile people, whatever, to most Jews today, I would say, this doesn't mean anything. To these people, it was a huge, huge deal. This speaks of a tremendous thing here. Why does God, I mean, Jesus is using, in all of these instances we've, we've touched on, the entire history of these people. He, why does he not say, oh, Bubba over here, he's going to judge you? You know, no, because they don't care about Bubba. They care about their history because they boasted in their history. They boasted that they were people that had been dealt with for thousands of years exclusively by God. For him to reach into their history and say, these people in your history are going to judge you because you have denied the thing they long for. You are refusing the climax, the culmination of everything they anticipated. Now, that's a big judgment. They wouldn't care if you would have said anybody... My God, he brought up Moses and said that Moses is going to judge us because we're missing the whole thing he wrote about. This is a this is a tremendous thing. So we're going to look at this Queen of Sheba, and we're going to see what happens there. And we're going to talk about this in the reference to knowing the truth. And in this story, you're going to see when the certainty of the words of truth come. Because you're going to see a woman who heard, and you're going to see a woman who saw. And you're going to see the transition between the two and the effect that it has. Not just hearing, but seeing. You're going to see when things were confirmed and a true judgment that takes place in her own heart when she sees this man. The knowing of the truth is the seeing of a man. And in that man, the certainty of every word written is, is, is seen, is embodied. You will never be the embodiment of any of the words you read in your Bible, ever. He is the embodiment of every word, and he is that in you. So the knowing of the truth is the knowing of him who is in you. And in the knowing of the truth, you are made free. And we're going to get to that freedom. And it's a beautiful thing. But it's freedom from the illusion we just referred to. It's freedom from the externalities by which we have defined something. Of spiritual life. And those things are never defined except in the person of the truth. As long as you are seeing yourself trying to define any of these spiritual realities, you are not liberated. There is no freedom. There is bondage. And it's bondage to yourself and your understanding. It's bondage to flesh. It's bondage. So, we'll stop there. But just remember, it's in reference here. And what I'm saying to you is what we're going to read in that story and what Jesus is saying to them is, the greater than Solomon is here. The antitype of that type, the meaning of that type, is come and is now in you. So when we read about the Queen of Sheba and her interaction and her encounter with this man, you have to realize that the substance that that man merely pointed to in all of his glory, Solomon in all of his glory, merely pointed to, was merely a testimony 
of the greater than Solomon who is resident in you right now. So when we read this encounter or read of it, uh, keep that in mind, and I think we'll we'll see something tremendous in it, okay? So we'll stop there. Tonight.